Hungary locks up its migrants. Trump gets blowback on wind power. And I wouldn't exactly say it makes your farmlands look beautiful. You got all these windmills all over the place. And white artists and black pain. A Michigan judge approved a settlement today in a lawsuit accusing the city and state of failing to protect Flint residents from lead-tainted water. Michigan will replace water piping in 18,000 Flint homes by 2020, at a cost of about $87 million. The White House submitted a budget proposal to Congress that would pay for the president's border wall by slashing close to $20 billion worth of domestic programs, including medical, infrastructure, and community grants. I believe that our caucus will do everything possible to make sure that U.S. taxpayer monies do not go to build a wall. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson hosted his counterparts from Baltic nations bordering Russia. The U.S. has been sending more troops to the region, part of a new NATO force that wants to prevent incursions like the 2014 annexation of Crimea. Following days of protests from the Chinese community and a complaint from Beijing, French police have agreed to open an investigation into the killing of a Chinese national in his Paris home. Xiao Yo Lu was shot in front of his children during a police raid on Sunday. Police say the officer fired in self-defense. Lu's family says he was holding a pair of scissors. Scotland will have a second chance to vote on independence from the UK, now that Brexit has officially started. In 2014, Scotland narrowly rejected independence. But that was before Britain decided to leave the EU. Scotland's future should be in Scotland's hands. That is what this debate is about, the future of our country. Hungary has been on the front lines of Europe's migrant crisis for years now, and Hungarians are tired of it. Today, a tough new law came into force there, giving border authorities new power to detain asylum seekers indefinitely and house them in converted shipping containers until their cases are heard. The UN says the measure is illegal. The country's hardline prime minister, Viktor Orban, says it'll save Europe. Mindaddig napi renden marad, amíg mindenhol be nem látják, hogy a migráció a terrorizmus trójai faluba. Most of the migrants here are actually trying to pass through to more prosperous European countries. But to the Hungarian government, it doesn't matter. And the new law sends a clear message to would-be border crossers. Don't try it. I'm warning you that you're at the Hungarian border. I'm warning you to hold back from committing this crime. Ez egy, tehát a teljes szerb határszakaszon kiépítették ezt a biztonsági határzárat, 174 kilométeren, több százan próbáltak meg átjutni, és szükség volt arra, hogy ezt a védelmet erősítsük, és legyen egy erősebb. At the height of the refugee crisis in 2015, up to 13,000 people were crossing the border into Hungary every day. Now barbed wire fencing, armed patrols and cameras means very few make it in. You have police patrolling the border, and when refugees or migrants try and cross over, you apprehend them. Can you tell me what the process is? Amennyiben mégis sikerül nekik átlépni, akkor a kollégáink feltartóztatják őket, majd visszakísérik a legközelebbi kapuhoz, és ott kiléptetik őket magyar területre. Én azt gondolom, hogy a jelenlegi rendszerünk biztosítja a Magyarország is egyben az Európai Unió határának biztonságát. Despite this, two new levels of security will make things even more difficult for migrants. A second barrier is being built by inmates from a local prison at a cost of more than $130 million. And the new law will now mean that all migrants and refugees, including women and children over 14, will be held in shipping containers like these, instead of camps, indefinitely. There'll be 324 in total, and people in existing camps may now be moved into them. They won't be allowed to leave unless their applications are successful. The reality is that most will be rejected, and when that happens, they'll be sent back across the border. It's meant to further deter people like Ashar, one of 8,000 migrants and refugees stuck in Serbian camps waiting to cross. I came to Serbia because I knew that the process was so easy. 
Ashar is 24 years old, from Iran, and has been stuck in Serbia for seven months. He says his name was taken off the list to enter Hungary because of a clerical error that was never explained to him. The Hungarian government allows no more than 10 a day to pass legally through to the transit zone. You could have crossed in, in uh, 12 to 15 days. So how does it feel to still be here after that? Depressing, stress, stressful and uh, frustrating, yeah. It's difficult to eat, yeah. I took some, of, some pictures of, the, of this uh, prison and, and sent it to some of my refugee friends and they were uh, crying from the inside. They were not able to believe it, but still, uh, they have to. It is the truth, they'll keep in the prison for a long time. Away from the Serbian border, closed camps like this one are already used to house some single men, who authorities think could be a security risk. They offer a glimpse of what's in store for migrants who cross in the future. Two men just came to the window. One of them said that he's from Libya and he's been here for three months and the conditions aren't great. And then another man came out and he's complaining that they don't have enough food. How many days are you here? They're telling us we're not allowed to speak to the guy. The security's here and telling us to stop talking to the people who are being held in there and complaining about the conditions. Human rights groups have sharply criticised the new policy and the conditions here. The European Union says it's sending a commissioner to examine whether Hungary is complying with its own rules on the treatment of asylum seekers. We are the human rights. We are human. We are not animals. We must go to open camp. We are crazy in here. The government insists that the new law is a much-needed deterrent. In 2015, you accepted 502 asylum seeker applications. Last year, you accepted 425. You capture most people who try to cross over illegally into the country. So why do you think that these extreme measures are needed? We think that the asylum border border is a very important question for the first place. And if we don't know where to go out the border, then olyan helyzetbe kerülnénk, mint egy gazdag ember, akinek nincs kerítése, és nem zárja be éjszakára az ajtót, bárki bejöhet. But the reality is that many of them are turning up in Hungary because they're desperate. And the idea that a 15-year-old child who's come from Syria will be held in a detention center indefinitely, is it not your responsibility to be doing more about this than just labeling them as a national security threat? A mi véleményünk szerint nem a problémát kell behozni az Európai Unióban, nem ott kell segítenünk, ahol, ahol a baj forrása keletkezik. Legyen szó pénzügyi segítségről. Valamennyi erőforrásunkat nem hozhatjuk el, mert akkor egy időmúlva nekünk sem marad. In the Serbian camps, there's evidence that Hungary's no compromise attitude could shift the problem from their borders, but that the new policy won't mark the end of the migrant crisis. The new law that Hungary is going, going to implement, it is, it is going to affect people. I would say mentally, because they already have been waiting for, for so long and uh, it is frustrating for them. So what are you hoping for now? I will, I will try to make a plan and, and, uh, and make my way towards uh, Croatia and try to cross illegally, yeah. Debates about America's relationship with Russia have been consuming Congress. I have no idea what they're even talking about. So go ask, go ask the other side. I will say this, we need an investigation. But today, the flashpoint wasn't spying or campaign collusion. It was a small Balkan country that most people wouldn't be able to find on a map. Alexandra Jaffe explains. Congress is so broken that it hasn't even been able to send a clear signal to Russia until today. The Senate voted 97 to 2 to add Montenegro to NATO. It's a way to push back against the Kremlin, which has been grabbing land along Russia's borders and which opposes expanding NATO in any way. It's a symbolic move. Montenegro is a tiny country and most of its neighbors are already in the alliance. But even that vote was complicated. Kentucky Senator Rand Paul single-handedly dragged out debate on the issue. He told me today before the vote that adding Montenegro would be reckless and wasteful. I don't think it adds to our national security, but in many ways the debate was a, I think, a proxy debate 
for, I think, the foolish notion of putting people like Ukraine and Georgia into NATO and the foolish provocation that that would be. Nearly every Republican disagreed with him today, but Paul's most vocal critic was, as usual, Senator John McCain. He said that adding Montenegro was about more than just the country itself. It is a test in this contest that we are now engaged in with Vladimir Putin. And last week, when Paul slowed down the process by objecting to fast-tracking the vote, McCain got pissed. The senator from Kentucky is now working for Vladimir Putin. So McCain won this fight, and the Senate overwhelmingly sent a message to the Kremlin. But it's just another example of how so much of our policy, domestic and foreign, revolves around Russia. President Trump signed his energy independence executive order today. It clear cuts through a swath of environmental regulations, including President Obama's clean power plan, which rewarded states that invested in renewable energies like wind power. With today's executive action, I am taking historic steps to lift the restrictions on American energy, to reverse government intrusion, and to cancel job-killing regulations. But the state that wagered the most on wind turbines wasn't California or Vermont. It was Iowa. And that bet has paid off in the form of a powerful local industry that won't take kindly to Trump's threats against it. Newton, Iowa is a small town of 15,000 people located about 30 miles east of Des Moines. In 2007, the Windblade manufacturer TPI Composites set up shop in Newton, bringing 500 new jobs along with it. Did you always expect that you'd end up working in a place that makes blades for wind turbines? No, didn't really even know it was a thing. And, you know, till about nine years ago when I started, my dad worked at Maytag for 26 years and he raised his family with that company. And now I feel like I'm raising my family with this company. Starting in the early 1900s, Newton was home to the Maytag Washing Machine Company, which employed around 3,000 people in its heyday. But Maytag moved its factory to Mexico in 2007, causing many in Newton to lose their livelihoods and, along with it, a sense of what the town's future held. Newton's story isn't an isolated case either. Throughout the American heartland, Wind jobs are on the rise. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, wind turbine technician is the fastest growing job in the US. And most of those jobs are found in agricultural places like this. Throughout much of the Midwest, the wind belt runs uh, from Texas up through the Dakotas. And, and Iowa strategically is a great location to develop and logistically maneuver and distribute blades to various locations throughout that Midwestern windmill. Four out of the top five states are actually uh, located throughout the Midwest in traditionally red districts, uh, Republican communities. Much of this comes in rural areas. You wouldn't expect to see wind fans in suburban areas or metropolitan areas because there's other obstructions to the wind. But none of this economic success seems to have had any impact on the politics. President Trump won Iowa by 10%, and yet he railed on the wind industry on the campaign trail. And I wouldn't exactly say it makes your farmlands look beautiful. You got all these windmills all over the place going, driving you loco when you look at them, right? Such rhetoric can make the future of renewables seem tenuous. But it wasn't always this way. Chuck Grassley has represented Iowa in the Senate for over 30 years. And he remembers when renewable energy wasn't so politically divisive. When this got started 30 years ago, it wasn't Republican or Democrats. We were running out of fossil fuels. Right. The frame of mind was that we got to do all we can to be energy independent. So that's where you uh, dealt with uh, every sort of alternative energy you can think of, and a tax incentive for it. Some of those tax incentives still exist. In 1992, Grassley sponsored the production tax credit, which cut costs for wind energy companies and gave them the momentum they needed to install more than 50,000 turbines across the U.S. The credit is scheduled to be phased out in 2020, 
though some are concerned that the current administration will attempt to accelerate that timeline. When tax credits for renewables expired in the past, construction of new installations dropped by up to 93%. And an industry-funded study projects that if the credit disappears again, 37,000 jobs could be lost. You know, you've mentioned President Trump. Prior to his election, you, you were quoted as saying that if he ever attacked the wind industry, he would do so over your dead body. Um, do you still feel the same way now? Anybody that wants to cut short the phase out of wind energy, which will happen in 2020, let's say they want to get rambunctious and do it in 2017, 18, or 19, right. uh, I think we can stop that. And I said it would be over my dead body. I guess it's over my dead body. The photograph of Emmett Till's mangled body is one of the most charged images in American history. It has recently become the center of a heated debate in the art world about who should and should not be able to reproduce it in their work. Not the winning by any pieces behind us. Jay Caspian Kang went to talk to one of the artists at the center of the controversy. Parker Bright is a 24-year-old artist who rents out a small studio space in Ridgewood, Queens. A couple weeks ago, Parker was looking through social media and saw that some fellow artists were discussing a work at the Whitney Biennial. This is the work in question, Open Casket. It's a painting of Emmett Till's dead body created by Dana Schutz, a successful artist who has courted controversy in the past. Schutz is white. The original photo of Till's battered face came from a decision his mother made to have an open casket funeral to show what white people had done to her black son. Parker and other critics believe that Schutz has erased that history and tried to make the image her own. I don't think black people should be talked for by anyone who is non-black. Yeah. When so Parker heard about right. Schutz's work, he decided to go to the Whitney, block people's view of the painting, and talk to them about his problems with it. Why did you decide to actually stand in front of the painting? I just had this very strong reaction to just put my body in front of there and have people um, confront me and as well as have conversations. I think the original image of Emmett Till um, that his mother put out has so much more impact than um, any sort of fine art reproduction could. There was really no reason for this painting to exist. Parker stood in front of Open Casket for two days. During that time, other artists spoke out against Schutz, including Hannah Black, who wrote an open letter to the Whitney calling for the painting to be destroyed. This demand, more than Parker's protests, sparked a heated debate about free speech in the art world that spilled over quickly into the broader media. The question at the center of all this debate, was Parker trying to start a talk about representation in art, or was he just censoring Dana Schutz? All what I did was just spark the conversation. Are you essentially arguing then for a segregated art world in which white artists um, would paint white subjects and black artists would paint black subjects? No. Our society is already segregated, okay, first and foremost. In the last couple years, there's definitely been like movements where there are people of color that want to create spaces that do not include white people. Like, I think, and I think that is perfectly acceptable. Schutz's supporters included the artist Kara Walker. Walker's own work uses troubling images from slavery and turns them into silhouettes. On Instagram, Walker wrote, The history of painting is full of graphic violence and narratives that don't necessarily belong to the artist's own life. She went on to argue that Jenna Liske, who painted the image seen here, was more than her own trauma and that artists should strive to find empathy outside themselves. Dana Schutz put out a statement and she said that while she doesn't understand what 
the black experience is, that she knows what it's like to be a mother, and that she felt this sort of overwhelming empathy, and that she wanted to make that into art. Like, of course, she can have a um, she can have a reaction to the to, to this to the image of Till, and the fact of the matter is, like, um, like her 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 child isn't black. <laughs> Parker's more dramatic critics believe these types of protests and controversy create a chilling effect that restricts artists from making the work that moves them. That may not be true. Open Casket, if nothing else, is proof that artists are still creating, quote, problematic art and having it prominently displayed. But the debate about representation and appropriation also feels stuck without much resolution on either side. Is there a way that, that uh, white artists could recreate the image of Emmett Till in a way that would be like that you would accept? No. No. Oh, this is awesome. Man, there's some good music out right now. I want it all. I like this song. If I was spitting game to a girl and then she told me to play some music, I would play this and I would sing all the words and I'd be smoking. Yeah, see, we like all types of stuff. Like if I was chilling with an older woman, so what do you want to hear? Just turn it on. <laughs> oh man, shout out to my girl, Katy Perry. Oh, hey, I ain't heard this drum, but hey. Kill it, Katy Perry. Her voice is like, a, like an 80s movie. I love her songs, bro. It made me feel like real cool, real hipster. Oh, Black on season with the book bag. Rat tag got a little kickback. Hunters on hunters got a good batch. You ain't never ever get your bitch back. You ain't never ever get your bitch back. You ain't never ever get your bitch what's back. The, what's the perfect situation to play that song in? Oh, if you like, got a limo or a sprinter, and you like, if you got a sprinter with the poles, and it's like strippers in the joint, you play joint. John Lennon. Song. Yeah, I'm about to say, I know this, this song. Okay, now we gotta figure out the girl's way, okay. It's Anita Baker. Um, Halle Berry? Christina Milian. Damn, that was a good guess. <laughs> but that wasn't a good Ariana guess. Ariana Grande. <laughs> Man! Oh, that, that was my next guess. Yo, this is a good song. You like the remake? I do like the remake, because it, cause it sounds like the old one. It sounds like the old one. She did, she did wonderful on Ninja. <laughs> That's Vice News Tonight for Tuesday, March 28th. 